All right, we are now live for another live reading from my book, uh, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. And we are picking up at page 215 in the middle of Maurice Blondel's um, presentation and the conversation that goes on about that uh, from the Etude, Société d'Études Philosophiques. So this was published in Les Etudes Philosophiques, uh, titled The Problem of Catholic Philosophy. And the last part of this, we've spent three, three of these sessions reading through this uh, longest part of the, the book, the longest thing that I translated. We had Maurice Blondel's presentation itself, and then we had some letters that were sent. The reason they, they were doing letters is Blondel was nearly blind at the time and did a lot of his work through correspondence and um, having a secretary read things aloud to him and then taking dictation. And then finally, there was a recorded discussion between Maurice Blondel, Jacques Pauliard, and Gaston Berger, people who are interested in all of these questions and issues, people also who are also part of the Société d'Études Philosophiques um, and who would regularly go to the meetings. So we're going to begin here. Discussion between Maurice Blondel, Jacques Pauliard, and Gaston Berger, Mr. Jacques Pauliard. How should we consider this interior demand for God whose character of universality we're concerned to set in full light and which would already be the Catholic fact? Must we see in it a psychological fact? But as much as the desire for God is incontestable for one who intimately makes an experiment of it, just as much it will appear contestable to others to inductively conclude that such a desire is universally the ground of human nature. Must we instead regard that fact as a historical fact observed from the outside? But then do all civilizations, all religious traditions manifest it with the same evidence? To look there where this demand for God presents itself with the preciseness you attribute to it, that is to look at it from the side of Christian tradition, this would be to provide ourselves with what instead needs to be established. It seems to me that observation, no more the historians and the psychologists, cannot be sufficient to apprehend the universality of this need you judge to be basic. From that point on, let it be a matter not simply of a fact to note, but of an essence to determine. Mr. Maurice Blondel, I thank you for teeming in my view and the surplus of precision that you demand. I have not claimed that experience under any of its psychological, historical, moral, or even mystical forms suffices to provide a clear and distinct idea of our divine appetite, even less of our supernatural vocation. And in a sense, if we stick with notions formulated in the spontaneous consciousness of the majority of people, it seems that God would be the absent, the misrecognized, the refused, the excluded, the denied one par excellence. Still against that appearance, we have to make two implicit attitudes converge. On the one hand, if there are idolaters, iconoclasts, anti-theists, there are actually no atheists, for nobody ceases living for what is not given and not finite, surpassing by thought and desire what is submitted to, striving towards an ideal, and consequently, as St. Thomas noted, awaiting or even already understanding the approach of an unknown, of a good, of a guest, before knowing that this desired visitor is happiness in God. On the other hand, reflection's normal role is precisely to make us recognize through all the illusions and failures the entirely close presence and the desired and solely salutary role of him who, even anonymous, can calm the restlessness or orient it towards the end point that can give it peace. Empirical data remain obscure and equivocal. A metaphysical interpretation, if it be very inclusive and com completely concrete, is thus indispensable, so that man raises himself per gradus debitos to what is his thought's proper object and his destiny's normal end. Thus, even faced with revealed and lived Christianity, a work of the soul and of reason remains indispensable. And as you say, there is in fact 
quote, an essence to determine. Whether at first to make the essential nature of reasonable being precise, or whether to measure its aspiration scope and by means of nature and its deficiencies to define the exact notion and what has been called the supernatural's desiderability. Jacques Pollyard. It seems then that this natural appetite for God would cling to a demand for surpassing that is not only a fact to observe, but a, a law or a form inherent to the structure of human thought. And I understand then that, coming back to observation, one would illuminate by this essential demand's light in the at first disconcerting diversity of human aptitudes, anticipations, or the haltings, the de deviations or the negations that always suppose the same fundamental law, Definitively, absolute religious indifference does not exist. Blondell, you note rightly that what most preoccupies the philosopher are the specific characters of this natural appetite for God. For even after one has had to admit this perpetual surpassing about which Pascal said that it proved man's vocation towards the infinite, an ambiguity and infidelity towards that call must be denounced and avoided. Without a doubt, the varieties of religious experience and of its interpretation are indefinite, and all can serve in good faith as vehicles for the saving faith and for the participation in the invisible and supernatural soul of the church. But this Catholicity of intention does not in any way make it so that these different forms would be objectively equivalent. The most inadequate, just as the highest, have value only by secretly participating in a precise and subsisting truth, as well as in a spiritual disposition that reflection's role is precisely to unfailingly discern. But if there is a Catholic philosophy, it is the one that explains the conditions and the complete demands of what, as a philosopher, St. Bonaventure called the intellect's itinerary. Taking note of this law of man's perpetual surpassing of himself by himself is not sufficient. It is a matter of not missing something here, not imagining that one pulls out of oneself the yearn for transcendence. Rather, one will be missing oneself from the moment on when one would claim to draw this transcendence from our very imminence or to make it come down here and to hold it by our own powers and our human reason. You are quite right. Therefore, to insist on the difficulty of discovering the true and pure solution above the counterfeits and the weaknesses of the religious aspiration. If it is, po this is Polyard, if it show that the natural desire for God is by itself powerless to attain its object, it is quite understandable then that the desire for a divine aid would not be itself of the natural order, but already something supernatural, a grace. Only will not this Catholic philosophy's most difficult task be showing that actually the empty space cannot be humanly filled. Certainly, it is not philosophy that will be able to conquer the good our soul desires if we understand by philosophy a work of organization of concepts that would aim at a closed systematization satisfied with itself. But for certain philosophers, is philosophy not something different? Is it not for them a matter of coming to live a life of the intellect that would truly be a life to strive by concentration of intellectual power towards a form of knowledge superior to discursive movements and to organization of concepts in the end to produce in oneself by the very path of philosophical meditation, an intuition metaphysical and mystical at the same time, and mystical because metaphysical, no longer a rational systematization that would be a religious and complacent in itself by its forgetting of the fundamental restlessness, but a noetic meditative contemplation that far from rejecting or ignoring religion would make us say to a person who practices religion that it is philosophy itself that under the highest form becomes religion. From that point of view, which is not my own, human thought would itself surpass itself, but in this way of surpassing, the God of the philosopher would be a God imminent to the thought of the philosopher. Can one show and how can one show that there is a pseudo-mysticism here? Blown out. Your question touches more and more on the problem's highest points, and I respond to it, and to respond to it, we would need here a longer examination. I undertake that elsewhere. Here I can sketch a response, 
only by referring myself, for example, to some of the recent works on St. John of the Cross and on Spinoza. Would we have to say that because there is a super discursive thought, a sort of acquired unitary contemplation analogous to mystical knowledge, this high speculation identifies philosophy and religion by absorbing the human into the divine itself, a sublime pretension. But is it realized in spirit and in truth in some other way than by a still illusory and illegitimate extrapolation? Is it not in formal contradiction with the very principle of our thought that sustains its consciousness and its life only by distinguishing its own being from the infinite object to which it aspires, without being able or wanting to be absorbed there in pure indetermination and infinity without contours? Would it be necessary that philosophy, in order to perfect itself, must abolish itself, and that the supreme finished state of knowledge would be the very disappearance of thinking and knowing? If we do not want that, if we cannot even want this, it is because actually we can no longer think it and affirm it without a fundamental illogic and a metaphysical impossibility. The law and the secret wish of our thought is to realize itself in the universal and the, the eternal, but without losing itself there. The entire problem is thus to constitute personal beings an infinite being, and from that point on to accept our own limits at the same time as accepting the divine gift that alone puts back in, in us the spirit of adoption and the perfect life, aspiring which is our entire reason for being. These assertions are not at all arbitrary, simplistically juxtaposed. They are enfolded within each other while remaining gratuitous on the side of the common author of nature and grace. To speak of a saturating intuition and of a philosophically mystical solution is to mix together incompatible assertions. It is to the profit of expressions, lending themselves to everyone, paying oneself off with illusions and believing oneself to have come to the perfect endpoint of the life of the mind at the precise moment when one kills in oneself the religious and philosophical spirit made from coherence, humility, and union. A union that is not in any way an identification in an impersonal unity, but that to the contrary assumes the multiplication of spiritual beings finding in their mutual and voluntary society and in their common participation in the divine charity, the consummation of these two charges, multiplicamini et un, ut unum citis, <clears throat> polyard. If now I think about the domain that this Catholic philosophy can explore, it seems to me that beyond researches whose direction can be indicated by a reversed form of St. Augustine and St. Anselm's dictum, Fidem Quaterans Intellectus, this philosophy must respond as well to the authentic formula, Fides Quaterans Intellectum. The first movement having been made, adherence to faith obtained, does philosophy, does, not, does philosophy then not have to dip into dogma, to meditate on dogma in order to find in it new food for its appetite for intelligibility? But then, do not the philosophers and the theologians' roles become quite difficult to discern from each other? Blondell. Granted, this is a tricky matter, unfolding the entire content of a philosophy that does not confine itself to a system of concepts, but cooperates with an entire organization of our thoughts and our actions, even when they may be penetrated by super rational stimulations. That, that is quite evident in itself. And still in another more true sense, Confusion of the true orders, nature, and grace must remain impossible to commit from that point on when my previously pointed out distinctions have been established and admitted. Actually, what is really supernatural can never, insofar as such, fall under the direct grasp of consciousness, nor be discerned with certainty by reflection. Even for speculative truths that seem to be affirmed in common by reason and faith, it must be said that there remains a formal heterogeneity between what is known and what is believed at the same time. Whence the inviolable rule that St. John of the Cross outlines from which so many spiritual men like Father Surin deplored being separated, to judge and act, even if one is engaged in extraordinary paths, by making use of all the resources of good sense and of science. So well that the doctor par excellence of the supernatural in man had to say that, quote, the true mystic is the most reasonable of men. Intellectus quirit intellectum fide et intellectu simul. 
Two inquiries that both of them actually make recourse to an organizing reason, but that remain formally differentiated according to our intellect's theological employment and philosophical employment. The conclusions of both science, even when they seem to harmonize, cannot be confused. That is why we must speak not of absorption of Catholic philosophy by theology or of the Christian contribution by rational speculation, but of a cooperation that respects the specificity and the heterogeneity of the method and the object of both investigations. I ask that I be excused for a so elliptical response to the immense question which we thank Mr. Pagliard for having raised in all of its statue. Mr. Gaston Berger, Berger, if we seek to characterize Catholic philosophy in its results, a difficulty seems to present itself. Either the demand that will end up in rationally establishing the philosophical effort will be precise. The human soul has the need for this kind of sacraments, this kind of dogmas. But then what will faith add? Or what the very essence of man and his total experience rationally interpreted demand is simply a belief, the admission of a, a radical transcendence, submission to some dogmas. And then faith's role remains in its entirety. But in this last case, can one speak of something other than a simply, quote, religious philosophy? Blown down. Your question is perhaps the one most important to bring to clarity, for it seems to lie beneath the majority of the difficulties subsisting in minds habituating to, habituated to conceiving philosophy as a partial discipline, well delimited and establishing itself in its rational autonomy. Actually, even for those who recognize some limits for philosophy, despite its pretension of being universal, the prevailing image is always that of a rigid fence in front of an abyss our reason cannot explore. But since we always have to make use of metaphors, there is another image I use to describe the reciprocal insertion of philosophical thought and Christian thought. Just as two gases can penetrate each other without combining or without hindering each other, so to speak, as if there were everywhere in them interstices that allow their direct cohabitation in the same area, in the same way the limits of philosophy are everywhere in its most intimate fabric. In studying the genesis and the ingredients of thought, I constantly find infinitesimal and real fissures, holes that require being filled and that admit consequently the presence or even the need of another reality of a heterogeneous and complementary datum. From that point on, the religious spirit intervenes everywhere without intrusion or confusion in the framework of philosophical thought. And I add that it is no longer a matter of an extrinsic line that would delimit an inscrutable abyss. It is a matter of gaps, of holes that offer determinable contours, and that by that very fact could not receive an indeterminate content. Thus, if in a general way, rational thought leaves in front of itself and in itself an empty space it cannot fill, this empty space is not entirely negative, entirely unformed. It is positive, attractive, of a definable form at least to a certain degree, sufficing perhaps to allow discernment of what cannot enter there and a sort of ultimatum proper for excluding unacceptable contributions. Also, faced with the normal deficiencies of reason, philosophy does not leave us completely indifferent and ignorant. It presents itself with intellectual and moral conditions, taking account of which is possible and required. But if one does so, one sees that all the religions are not equally acceptable, nor even innocent, even if by their speculative side, far from being a scandal for reason, far from halting its march, dogmas serve as a ramp for reason's climbing, liberate it from its falls, and raise it to a more complete and comprehensive vision. Let us reassure ourselves, above all, about the irreducibility of positive religion. Despite all the possible justifications and investigations, there subsists in it a specific originality, a mystery that always uncovers itself under the veils of faith. Berger, 
Still, the term Catholic, which you use in preference to the term Christian, does it not indicate that the philosopher, solely by rational effort, comes to lay out a certain core framework of dogmas? Blown out. It is not the detail of dogmas that is the first and principal object of Catholic philosophy. It is the very spirit in which the dogmatic teaching is conceived and received. The intellectual core framework of which you speak doubtless serves for historical and critical studies from which philosophy can benefit. But the Christian truths are not the Christian spirit, and none of the doctrinal coincidences still serve so long as a conversion of the intellect and of the entire soul is not grasped as the condition of the new man, that Christianity must draw out from the old man. Neither the concordances between rational assertions and revealed teachings, nor even the motives of credibility contributing to render belief in revelation reasonable, constitute what is essential in adherence to Catholic truth and to Catholic life. The essence of the debate bears on the motive of faith, completely different from the motives of credibility, to use a distinction whose importance the theologians have made precise. It is really a matter of knowing how and why the order of grace insinuates itself in and imposes itself on nature and reason by perfecting them without suppressing them and without dispensing with them. This is a problem that neither history nor even moral psychology ever touches, and that is nevertheless inserted into the depths of every human thought and every human life. A problem just as delicate to raise as that of the supernatural insofar as it remains unconscious, but that under the anonymous form where psychological and rational data are its vehicles under the very veil in which it is wrapped engages the inevitable question of our eternal responsibility. A problem, consequently, that connected in one respect with the most personal dispositions of the human being is at the same time really attached to the historical and ontological order of the divine plan. And this is what explains how it becomes more and more apparent that the Catholic ideal sustains in humanity the vitality of the idea of God and of the religious soul, even if that ideal is misunderstood or attacked by those who still or already take advantage of it. This is one of the reasons why I spoke of Catholic philosophy, for this term has a meaning that is at the same time stronger, more precise, and more broad. Christian is something like the last name belonging to the religious family that has, if we can speak this way, a civil status in the highest history of peoples and civilization for 19 centuries now. The name Catholic, while it seems restrictive, is to the contrary, the universal and permanent name, the human and divine name, that what implying all that the most authentic Christianity contains of historical reality, of defined dogma, and of supernatural aid, extends itself to all souls of good will, to souls who are prior to or exterior to the preaching of the gospel, but who are really in communion with the total assembly of minds, faithful to the light of reason, of conscience, and of the most secret graces. How much I would like the, to thus satisfy Mr. Berger, Berger's so opportune and so profound question, this would be perhaps the best way to bear witness to him of my deep gratitude for the generosity with which he animates this Société de Philosophie and the intellectual hearth whose warmth he causes to spread afar. And that is the end of part two of the book, and we're ready to jump into part three uh, in further readings of this, which will include Antonin Sertiange's on Christian philosophy, um, Bruno de Solage's The Problem of Christian Philosophy, uh, Fernand von Steinbergen's The Societe Tomi's Second Day of Studies in the Notion of Christian Philosophy, and then finally, um, Maurice Blondel's Foreign Integral Philosophy, responding to um, von Steinbergen, and Leon Noel's The Notion of Christian Philosophy. So we have quite a bit coming up from this, this book, uh, five more sessions at least. Now, I will take questions and comments. And first, I'm going to, while other people are writing stuff, um, I'm going to address O. Constanty B's uh, stuff here, which I think um, is the questions are off to begin with. And it's not a surprise since whoever that is wrote them in the first minute of this reading without listening to anything else that was in the reading. 
uh, presumably without having read, you know, the passages in this book. And so, you know, they're, they're kind of generic and off-base questions, which not particularly uh, great conversation starters, but I'll address them anyway. But I do want to say this. It's probably better to write questions that are a response to what we're actually discussing in these sessions, right? There is a point to this. And, um, you know, it's easy to, to lose that. So I, I'm not even sure what the isn't that uh, refers to. Isn't that just a rehearsal of Aquinas' and other religious metaphysics? So anytime that somebody says, isn't that just, not a good way to start uh, a conversation, not a good way to start philosophy. Um, there, we want to avoid a sort of reductionism. We want to avoid a sort of dogmatism. We want to avoid a sort of shoot from the hip kind of thing. Um, Aquinas metaphysics is extraordinarily complex. And if you're going to expand it to other religious metaphysics, like say that of Maurice Blondel, who is one of the main people in this debate, very complex as well. So there's no just about that anyway. I don't know what a rehearsal means in this case. Do you mean like a repetition or do you mean like uh, it can't be getting ready for it because Aquinas was, you know, uh, hundreds of years earlier, right? So uh, the, the question almost doesn't make sense. Then, um, and I, again, don't know what this is responding to since it was written like before we even got through the first minute of this. There's a Kierkegaardian tendency here, a return to faith in moments of doubt. No. That is not what is going on here. And um, Kierkegaard isn't the only person who returns to faith in moments of doubt, but that's very oversimplifying. So again, very little to work with here. Um, when you write questions, you want to be responding to what we're actually talking about here. Um, so that is that. Um, Mark says, I find the concept of grace hard to wrap my head around, but I guess that's the point. It's mysterious. Is there some way to get a better grasp of it? I would say, yeah. I mean, one definite way to get a better grasp of it is to read other thinkers who talk about grace. You know, um, It is always going to, by its very nature, be something that surpasses our intellectual capacities, but that doesn't mean that we can't wrap our head around it to some degree, both in, we could say, in the abstract or generic and in particular situations. So, you know, for example, St. Anselm is somebody who, who's quite interested in, you know, making some sense out of that. Augustine is somebody who's, you know, there's like a whole tradition of reflection upon uh, grace on um, aid that is provided gratuitously, you know, gratia. Uh, that's that's what what grace is. And um, you know, it's it, in the case of Blondell, it's good to keep in mind what he's saying here, which is tr you know typical Orthodox Christianity. Grace is not something that's like you know like oil and water. Here's grace and here's nature. No, they permeate each other. I mean, any god that can do something in history and you know has some sort of, you know, in intelligence is not just going to be like hammering grace on top of, you know, some, some sort of recalcitrant nature. But the relations between grace and nature in Christian theology and philosophy are quite complex. So that's, that's I mean, it's a really important topic to, to plumb. Um, Wada says, as you, you mentioned, coincidentally in your reading, if you're talking about grace, now that's intelligence. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that's intelligence. Um, do you mean that's, that's an intelligent way of looking at grace, or do you mean that grace is involved with the human intelligence? It's, it's a little un, unclear to me there. But any other questions, comments about the stuff that we're uh, covering in here. I mean, by, by the way, if, if you do want to make sense out of what's being said, you might want to get the book, right? get, get your hands on a copy of the book. And it, that might mean uh, getting your library to, to get a copy because it is, it is a bit expensive, unfortunately. Catholic University of America Press priced it at uh, 75 bucks rather than what I wanted, which was 50 bucks. Um, they're the ones who get to call the shots since they're the press, right? <clears throat> and um, 
Yeah. So why does says I super superior intelligence and religion's deity? I, I still don't know what 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 you mean by that. You're you're just sort of throwing out like little morsels, but you're not connecting them together. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, like I said, we will be uh, over the next coming months. We have uh, five more chapters to get through, and they're all you know pretty short. Um, well, we might have to break, I don't know, 16 pages, uh, Blondell's for an integral philosophy. We might have to break that into two bits. Actually, Fernand von Steinbergen is also 16 pages, uh, but the rest of them are pretty short. We're making some decent progress here. Uh, Mark says, just a note, I finally got a hold of a copy of Blondell's Axion. Looking forward to reading it. Just got to find the time. Yeah, Blondell's Axion is his uh, his dissertation, or at, properly speaking, his second dissertation, because in the French, you know, um, uh, educational establishment at that time, you had to write <coughs> a dissertation in French and a dissertation in Latin. Things have gotten considerably easier since then, and. <clears throat> Because of writing Axion and because of the way the French Academy was structured and because of uh, the very anti-Catholic um, uh, animus in the French Third Republic, uh, writing Axion got him barred, basically, from getting a teaching position for uh, uh, two years. And then he was assigned to go teach out in the sticks <laughs> rather than in Paris, which he did, and he was fine with doing that. Oxion, Oxion uh, 1883 is a really great, <clears throat> great work. Um, he will revise it later on, you know. He will rethink some of the things that he's doing there. But the revisions are always, you could say, expansions rather than rejections of original um, theses or approaches that he has. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good work to get, um, not very often read. You definitely want the translation by Oliva Blanchette, not the translation by James Somerville. I asked Oliva Blanchette in emails um, why he, he chose to retranslate the work. <clears throat> and he said that he was teaching Blondell at Boston College, and he became so dissatisfied with how crappy the Somerville translation was that he decided he needed to undertake his own translation project. And he, he did that. And his translation is quite good. He also has a wonderful, roughly thousand page intellectual biography, uh, which I believe is titled Maurice Blondell and Intellectual Life. And if you want to know more about Blondell and not just his, his ideas, but his history, that is probably the book to go to. Um, and it, it came out 10 years ago, I, I want to say. Um, uh, somebody's got Cyrillic things. Can you explain some fundamental differences between Catholic Christian philosophy and Eastern Orthodox one? Well, there isn't an Eastern Orthodox one, and there isn't a Catholic Christian philosophy. There, there are both are, are buckets that contain many, many people. Um, I was actually just talking about this with a friend this morning. I was mentioning the fact that I'm, I'm reading, you know, Augustine's Confessions again because I'm going to be teaching it. And he's, he's he, at one time, he was Eastern Orthodox. He was like, oh, yeah, the Eastern Orthodox, they really don't like Augustine. And I was like, yeah, they don't like Anselm either, but almost none of them have actually read the stuff that they're complaining about. Um, and, you know, you can say the same thing goes for, uh, you know, Catholics reading Eastern sources very often doesn't happen at all. But they're, they're very varied. There isn't just, you know, fundamental differences. There aren't really fundamental differences. There isn't a Catholic take and an Orthodox take. And anybody who tells you that there is is full of shit and uh, peddling some sort of, you know, theology of their own. Um, there, there's an awful lot of polemics out there. And you want to try to avoid those. You don't want to get bought. You don't want to buy into those sorts of things. So they share way more in common than than what they disagree upon. I mean, we, we could talk about like, you know, leavened or unleavened bread. Who gives a shit? That's not really an important topic, although some people made it so. You know, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these things that people get very, very hung up on turn out to be quite unimportant. So all right. Any other um, 
questions, comments, <clears throat> things that people want to know specifically about the book, about Blondell, about the debates, about those sort of topics. Um, otherwise, we'll probably call it a, a, a short session. We're already 35 minutes in. We'll do another of these. Uh, when do I have the next one scheduled? Um, maybe next week, maybe the week after that. Trying to get like, yeah, probably can get one done next week. I'm trying to get like, you know, at least two or three done a month um, so that we can keep making progress in this. Um, so Derek says, much of this is above my understanding, but I appreciate you doing this. I'm new to philosophy and have been enjoying your content. Well, great. Yeah. This is, this is very much a metaphysical debate, right? Um, and it has to do with the nature of philosophy itself. It is being carried out by people at a very high level of, um, development who are writing to each other. And, and th that's one thing that's actually missing in some respects, except with Bruno de Solage's contribution, which is a, a presentation to the general public, which we're going to get to in uh, two weeks or two sessions from now. Um, and he uses metaphors to sort of clarify these metaphors of mountain peaks. That is quite an attractive way of thinking about it. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of sort of high level stuff going on here in, in these discussions. And, you know, there's there's other books as well. So I mean, this is part part of the translation of the debates. Um, Etienne Gilson has some works that are translated that are germane to it, like the Spirit of Medieval Philosophy or Philosophy and Christianity. Uh, Jacques Martin has the essay on Christian philosophy that that is translated as well. And those are sort of companion pieces to this. I should probably do some writing about that down the line. You know, like here's here's how to read about these debates, but. All right, uh, another from the Cyrillic writing person. Thank you. Do you think that impact of Christian philosophy of modernist philosophical thought is positive or negative? I mean, again, you're asking sort of like, is the is the ocean in the Atlantic or the Pacific? That's all over the place. I mean, it's it's both. I, I can say this to you, that um, Blondell thought that it was extraordinarily important in our time that Christianity definitely engage modern philosophical thought, not necessarily modernist, which is a different thing. There's a variety of ways of understanding modernist, but um, that we, you know, we have to we have to engage modern philosophical thought and sift it, see what's true in it, what you know replaces or surpasses the ways that we've looked at things in the past. Um, I mean. The other part of the question, I think that Christianity had contributed to develop of individual reasoning. Yeah, I guess. And so did Plato. And so did Aristotle. And so did the Stoics. And so did Buddhism. And so did, and we can go, oh, so did, so did, so did. Um, I, I don't know that Christianity has the market cornered on that. You know, spe and specifically Christianity in modern times. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a Hegel take in, in some ways, right? Uh, but that's kind of bad history of, of ideas because we can find all these other emphases on individual reasoning and thought in, in the past as well. So, all right. So I think that's probably it. I don't see any new questions. I'm going to say um, see you next time. We'll pick up with Antonin Sertiange's uh, piece. I'm a big fan of Sertiange. He's a great Thomist philosopher. Um, everything's coming from this this text. And we'll see you next uh Thursday. Here, here's a, uh, you know, uh, totally irrelevant question. Uh, what do you think of pandemic conspiracies related to freedom? What the hell does that have to do with this? This is a, this is a session that is a live reading on this, this work. Um, this is not an AMA. Those are the sort of questions that are good for AMA, which means ask me anything, not um, just you know jump in and ask me random stuff. Where these are, these are kind of focused on 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 you know the topics that we're uh, working on here. All right, so I'll see everybody later.